Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com and part one of our two-part study from the book of Revelation titled, How to Identify the Beast. We now join this study from Revelation chapter 13, How to Identify the Beast, part one of two. All right, we've been in Revelation 13 and we've been doing some uh, preliminary studies before we go verse by verse through the whole chapter. And we come right up to the beginning and we see this beast rising up out of the sea. And we studied the nature of the beast. That a, The beast in Scripture is a reference to a man and to a system, a kingdom. The one world government that everybody's being propagandized and brainwashed and getting ready for. The Bible said that would happen and it's going to happen and this beast will be at the head of it and then his, the whole government system, kingdom system is referred to in the, as the beast. And we looked at the identity of the beast, meaning that the Bible says that there is a character named called the son of perdition. And uh, we looked at how Judas is the only man in the Bible called the son of perdition. And so if you didn't get that study last week, you'll want to watch that whenever we get there. And now we're going to discover how to identify the beast. And the, it's, we're going to see that none of these books that have been written, none of these uh, movies made, documentaries where they try to prove so-and-so is the Antichrist, are worth your money. So don't get suckered into anybody. Somebody, somebody sells you a book and says, you know, uh, there are 13 reasons why Jesus will return by the end of 2013. Don't buy that book. No man knows the day or the hour. No one knows the times or the seasons. You know, people, people like to quote that one, say, well, he doesn't know the day or the hour. That means we might know the month or the year. No, Jesus said in Acts 1, we don't know the time or the seasons. And also, uh, when it comes to the Antichrist, we're going to see that uh, we're not going to be able to identify him except by a certain uh, act that will set everything off. And then after that, there are other things that will confirm that this is the man. Now, this, this message is largely for uh, our benefit in understanding so that we don't get suckered into some gimmick. But it's also something that you ought to take time to share with your unsaved friends and relatives. Because if they are left behind and they see this one world dictator come and take power over the one world government, and they see these things happen, maybe that will help them decide to not take the mark, not be a part of this, and to follow uh, Jesus Christ, which could mean they follow Him to their death. Now, verse 1, just to set the stage, let's go ahead and read that. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, we covered that in a previous message. We're not going to revisit that. But we do want to see that uh, there is an answer to this question of how will the tribulation saints know the Antichrist? And how do we identify him? He's not going to be called Mr. Antichrist. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. You know how they do that? Well, they're not going to do that when he stands up to speak to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Antichrist. I was listening to Pete Ruckman teach and, and uh, he was teaching on the Gospel of John and he has about 75 people in his Bible Institute. And he said, uh, he stopped and he said, what, wait a minute, what class is this? This is 1 Thessalonians? And everybody laughed. And they're like, John! And they were, then they started laughing, like making fun of him, you know, that he didn't even know what he was teaching. And uh, I, I thought, man, I can identify with him. You got so many things going on. And he said, and most of these guys are going to be preachers. He says, I'm going to wait about 10 years and then we're going to call you up. 
And now I'm going to ask you what's going on. You're going to say, well, we got this going on, that going on. I'm teaching this. I'm preaching here. I'm doing that. And he said, I'm going to do, I'm going to do what you just did. I'm going to go, Because <laughs> that's how they sounded when they laughed at it. But anyway, uh, uh, that's easy to do. All right, so after the gathering, we have the Antichrist being revealed and thus begins what's called the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble is also called Daniel's 70th week. It's also called the time of tribulation. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. That's reference to the rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, and that's talking about people, like false teachers, YouTube videos, that sort of thing. Right now, there are people teaching you're in the tribulation period. Did you know that? A guy named Irving Baxter on Daystar and TBN is teaching that. You go on the YouTube, there's all kinds of people out there teaching that. If you understand the Scripture, you know that's crazy. But that sells books. And that's why they do it. Don't be troubled, nor by letter, which would be like a newsletter or a blog. As from us, that's like these false books that claim to, you know, the lost books of the Bible and that sort of thing. As that the day of Christ is at hand. So he's saying... The, the day of Christ is the day when He pours out His wrath. And He's... That's the tribulation. So if someone says, you're in the tribulation, the seals are breaking, oh, look! They, they have no idea what they're talking about. And that's what was going on here in the church of Thessalonica. And Paul says, don't be troubled, don't be shook up when you get that kind of nonsense from these guys. He says, uh, the day of Christ... First of all, is not the rapture, and that causes confusion. The rapture is the last or the next big thing to happen before the day of Christ. But they're not the same thing. So you can kind of date the day of Christ is going to be unleashed after the rapture. But it's not the rapture, it's different. The rapture is the last event necessary before the day of Christ begins when Antichrist is revealed. Most of you, I think, understand that. The next big thing to happen is the rapture. Anything else you see going on in the world, it, it could be related to end times prophecy, but there's nothing else that needs to happen. The next thing to happen is a trumpet sound and we go. Now, after that is when the day of Christ will begin, and the day of Christ will begin after that, but there's, a, there's an event that will set the whole thing off. Verse 3. Read that with me. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. This is saying that that day, the day of Christ, those uh, seals, trumpets, and vials we're studying, will not happen except there come, first of all, a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The falling away is the final piece of furniture that needs to be set on the stage for the Antichrist and the whole end time tribulation period scenario. And that rapture actually results in the falling away. Are you following me there? You say, why? Follow me on, we're going to continue. This is the order of advance that spark the Great Tribulation Period, as it's called. The time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. The rapture result is global apostasy. I want you to get that in your mind. Not since the days of Noah has the world seen such a thorough and complete apostasy as it will the moment after the rapture. You remember the flood. The story of the flood involved eight people getting on a boat. Everyone outside of that boat was apostate. They were far from God. When the rapture takes place, 
the exact same thing. That time by water, this time by fire. When the flood took place, the world went into total apostasy minus those eight people on the ark. And when this happens and the rapture takes place, the entire world that's left are unbelievers. Total apostasy. So, and I've said this before, you actually find theologians disputing over whether the falling away refers to the rapture or something else. And my contention is it refers to both. When the rapture happens, that's when the falling away is complete. So there's no use arguing about it. Jesus said this, Luke 17, 26. This is the words of Jesus Christ to be read if you've got a red letter Bible. And as it was in the days of Noah, Noah is short for Noah. So when I look at you and say, No, get up here. You know what I'm talking about. So shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man, the day of Christ. The days of the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Come on, you can say it. Come on. Jesus, Jesus yeah. Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. It'll be as it was in the days of Noah. What was it in the days of Noah? Well, we could list all the things. Filled with violence. Sexual immorality rampant. Child abuse. Domestic violence. Apostasy. And that's what we're facing today. How many were saved in the flood? Answer? Come on, man. I'm giving you the answers. <laughs> wow. One more time. How many were saved in the flood? Zero. Yeah. Now, there were eight that were saved from the flood, but not in the flood. And in the... There were eight in the ark, lifted up. That's the same idea as raptured. Lifted up. Billions left on earth lost and dying. And that's what's going to happen at the rapture. Now, the rapture results in global apostasy. And then number two, that's all you need to know. There's, there's those two. These two things set the stage for the first thing that will reveal the Antichrist. These two events set the stage for the first event that will reveal the Antichrist. What's number two? The man of sin revealed. This revelation of Antichrist begins when he shall confirm the covenant. You see that? You have the rapture and that results in the falling away. And the number two thing is the Antichrist being revealed that starts the seven year countdown. That's the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. At this point after the rapture is when the Antichrist confirms the covenant with Israel and achieves world peace. We don't know how much time. The rapture takes place and it may be days, weeks, months. Some people argue it could be a few years. But after the rapture at some point, then you have this diplomatic genius who is going to set the stage by, uh, and will be identified because he is able to confirm the covenant. The covenant. Remember last week we said the son of perdition? Well, there, there's only one covenant that God calls the covenant. Now, who can tell me what that is? What is the one covenant that he calls the covenant? when he's talking about the Jews. There's a hint. The Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant. The law, the temple, and the sacrifices. That's the covenant. When Daniel writes what he has been told in Daniel chapter 9 that we studied, and he says he shall confirm the covenant, Daniel only knows one, the covenant. And that's the Mosaic Covenant. In Daniel 9.27, go ahead and turn there. Uh, by now, you ought to have that probably dog-eared and highlighted and notes written around it. But this is a very important passage for understanding the things we're studying, especially right now in Revelation. But in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, we don't have time to go through the whole text. We've done that before. But it's talking about the Antichrist. The prince of the people that shall come. And it starts in verse 27, it says, and he, talking about that Antichrist that the book of Revelation calls the beast, 
and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Seven years. We, we've explained all that before. The weeks in Daniel's prophecy refer to seven years of weeks. Or seven weeks of years. Seven years. One week is seven years. The Antichrist will confirm the covenant. We've talked about there are 70 weeks in Daniel's prophecy. Each week represents seven years. The 69th week was completed, but then that 70 weeks prophecy is in suspension until after the rapture. And this is what will start it off. There's one week left. One seven year period left. And that will be kicked off when the Antichrist confirms the covenant. What that means is that it will allow the Jews in Israel, in Jerusalem, to build a temple. And they will begin sacrificing animals again on that temple mount in Jerusalem. And that is, I guess, put it this way. Okay, if this is true, then what should we see? We should see in Israel preparations being made to build a temple, right? How many of you are aware that we've seen that? Yeah. Yeah. We studied that a few weeks ago. We showed the videos of it. They have uh, uh, multimedia uh, videos showing the whole blueprint on, in computer graphics. They've got a museum right now that holds all of the needed artifacts and tools. They're already made. And so since they can't build the temple yet, they decided, hey, let's make some money off this. I hate to say this, but you know they're Jews. <laughs> And they're like, I ain't going to just put this stuff in a closet and let it sit. Let's make some money off of this. So the government helped them build a museum. They put all that stuff in the museum. And now they charge people to come in and look at the stuff that's going to be used when they build the temple. That's what you'd expect to see. Amen? Amen. If this is going to happen anytime soon, and it is. Now look, when he says they confirm the covenant, he goes on to talk. We're going to come back to this. But he talks about the sacrifice and oblation. That's talking about the temple. Future. He will confirm the covenant. And then in the midst of that week, He'll cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That means there must be a sacrifice and oblation. Amen? Amen? i got to make sure you're awake. Come on. Amen? Alright? So that means there's going to be a temple. And they're going to be offering sacrifice. Are they doing that right now? No. They're not doing it, and yet they're ready to do it. They're set up for it. This, what we call the covenant, is the Mosaic covenant. Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are then explained further in the book of Exodus. It's kind of like the revised code where they explain everything. And involved in that is the tabernacle, which later became a temple, and the sacrifices. So the reference to sacrifice and oblation is in reference to the Mosaic Law and Temple sacrifices for national and individual sins. National sins, it's important for you to understand there's both when it comes to Israel. When it comes to us, it's just individual sin. When it comes to Israel, you have a national issue and then you also have individual sin. And I wish I could go into some detail on that because it's fascinating. We will at some point. So this covenant is counterfeit. Jesus paid for sin already. You already had the true Messiah, the true Christ show up. And He's already offered His blood and paid the full price for sin. But you have a counterfeit. You have a counterfeit Christ. That's what Antichrist is. And He also has the counterfeit covenant. Turn to Isaiah 28. And we're going to look at a few verses there. I want you to see this. This is directly tied to this covenant that will be uh, engineered and brought to reality by this Antichrist. And this is the number one thing that when he does this, you got your man. So I, I hear these people always trying to prove that, you know, uh, Reagan, Kissinger, uh, Bush, Clinton, Obama, uh, you know, and then it's then it's the Spanish guy. There's some guy in Spain. They try to say, 
all of them that are Antichrist. I'm like, you're not going to be able to prove that. The only way you can prove who the Antichrist is is when he confirms the covenant with many for one week. That's it. That's the number one thing. And boom, after that, then there are other things we'll look at. So we have this counterfeit covenant. And Isaiah talks about it. In verse 14, it starts by saying, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Who's in Jerusalem right now? The Jews. You wonder why Satan and, and the evil and wicked of this, kind, uh, this world are trying so desperately to get the Jews either out of Jerusalem or to get Jerusalem into international hands? Satan knows the Scripture. He's trying to thwart the prophecies. Now read verse 15 with me. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge should pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. And folks, we've gone and shown over and over these. The, the Revelation, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Zechariah, there's all these constant back and forth where they refer to the same things and you know what they're talking about. And he's just talked about the people back in Jerusalem and they make a covenant. Daniel 9.27, the covenant. And they make it with death and with hell. That's what's going to happen when the Antichrist shows up. The covenant not only identifies the Antichrist, but triggers the time of Jacob's trouble. When the beast brings the world together and confirms the covenant allowing the temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem and the Jews to begin sacrificing, that is the opening of the gates and the great tribulation. Now you're already in Isaiah 28. Look at verse 16. It says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. If you were here Sunday, you know that that's Jesus Christ. It's a reference to Jesus. Now look what it says. He that believeth shall not make haste. That's saying that a Jew who believes in Jesus will not go through this time of tribulation. But those who do will make haste. Jesus said, pray that your flight be not in winter. You're going to be in Judea, you're going to have to head for the mountains. We studied about two months ago, they're going to go to the city on the rock, Petra. That's what that's talking about right there. Verse 17. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail, revelation, shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. Petra. There you go. It all interconnects. Now read verse 18 with me. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. Heavy stuff. Zechariah says that two out of three Jews will be killed by the Antichrist. One third will survive. People will talk about us who believe the Bible and they'll say, you guys are wanting the Jews to be killed. You want all this. And No, no, no. no. We don't want this. We just know what it says. They have falsely accused Christians of trying to instigate this to happen. No. We believe we're going to be gone when it is instigated. Um, it, we are talking about something that God has said this is going to happen. And they are going to make this covenant with death and that is when you know who the Antichrist is and that marks the beginning of the Great Tribulation period and God says it will not stand. He will disannul the agreement with hell. And the overflowing scourge shall pass through it. We won't go through all that, but those are all, if you've, if you've been reading your Bible, you, it's ringing bells. Thinking Daniel 9, Revelation 6, all this. So read 19 with me. For the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. 
For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. That's the Great Tribulation. A time like no other. Jesus said it would be like nothing we've ever seen before. So this is the key to understanding. Now, if you have unsaved loved ones who say they you know, don't believe the gospel or they don't want to hear it, but they'll talk to you about anything else, throw this out there sometime just so they understand. Listen, you know, you may mock me or whatever, but if I disappear and you're left behind, then at some point right after that, there's going to be a world leader who's going to make Obama look like a joke. Because everybody's going to fawn, fawn over this guy. Uh, right now, it's like mostly only left-wingers fawned over Obama. When the uh, Antichrist comes, the Republicans, Democrats, and Libertarians are mostly all going to get in line. It's, it's across the board. And when he sets up this covenant with Israel and allows Israel to rebuild the temple, you better run. You better grab everything you got and you better head for the hills. Because the Bible has told you ahead of time that that's going to happen, so you know when that happens, guess what's going to happen next? Whatever the Bible says. Amen. If the Bible says one, two, three, four, five, and you keep saying, whoa, 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 at some point, common sense has got to kick in. You've got to pack your bags and head for the hills. Amen? Yeah. I mean, it should do that now. Common sense, but it's not common. So once you establish the timeline and settle this key that we talked about, it's an initial evidence for the Antichrist. The rest just kind of falls into place. First, we have the confirmation of the covenant. And then, at that same time, here's what I believe. Uh, this is a bit conjecture. This is a little bit of Gregism. Because I haven't been able to just flat out prove it from Scripture. But I still haven't got that book down yet, so give me some time. Um, I might be able to find something in there to nail this down a little better. But here's what I believe. I believe that He will confirm the covenant and already be a darling of the world. But when he confirms the covenant, that's when they say, this isn't a man. This is a God. Because listen, folks, what does everybody want? You know, wasn't it, which, which was it, uh, the great composer, I know this, but I can't find it up here right now. The composer who wrote, oh, wasn't it in uh, Handel's Messiah? where he talks about the desire of nations. You know, a lot of people say, have talked through the years that that's Jesus they're talking about. No. The nations don't desire Jesus. The desire of nations is world peace and unity. The desire at Babel was what? Be sure to unity. visit our website at bbfohio.com for links to hundreds of of audio and video messages, as well as articles, links, and other free resources, and a new bookstore being developed offering additional items. This message was brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship. I am Pastor Greg, and we thank you for listening. There is an ancient book that remains a mystery to most of the Earth's inhabitants. It tells us why we are here, reveals the mysteries of heaven and the horrors of hell, and the hero is God himself in our Lord Jesus Christ. Learn of the Ancient of Days by listening to Bible Believers Fellowship Saturdays at noon and Sundays at 9.30 p.m. on 91.5 Freedom. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.